So welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming out. I'm really excited to share uh, this stuff with you. It's amazing and powerful and it's something that you can do throughout the day any and every day and it can be a major event like the breath journey which is another workshop that we do. So to start out to help us all get present in the room and relaxed, we're going to do something called sung breathing. And for anybody, uh, any of the regulars here at Awakening Wellness, this will be a review, but sung breathing is basically relaxed breathing. It's abdominal breathing, so we're breathing in through the nose, down into the belly, and then out through the nose. So the belly fills up, it moves away from the spine on the inhale, and on the exhale, it moves back towards the spine. So if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes, sit up nice and straight. And we're just gonna do a couple minutes of sun breathing. So breathing in at your own pace through the nose, into the belly, and then letting go of that breath back out through the nose. And bringing your awareness to your heart, the center of your body, the center of your energetic system. On the inhale, focus on receiving into the heart. Whatever's right and perfect for you to receive. And on each exhale, just let it go, whatever's right and appropriate for you to let go, keeping your awareness in the heart. And as we breathe deep into the belly, just know with each exhale, you can let go of more and more that it's no longer serving your highest and best good. Just allow that to leave. And now bring, as you continue to breathe deep, bring your awareness down to your feet and feel a connection from your feet to the earth. Even if you're sitting cross-legged, just feel that energetic connection from the root of your body through your feet. Feel yourself connected to Mother Earth. And when you feel that connection nice and strong, you can slowly open your eyes. Fully present in your body.
So that was the first breath exercise of the day. We'll be doing a few more. And that's a really simple and easy one that you can do at any time. You can, you can make your intention to sit and breathe your way into a meditation. You can make your attention to ground. Um, you can make it just to relax. And the intention and the breath are the powerful parts of that. So how do you feel now compared to how you felt right before the breath exercise, the breathing? Anybody notice a change or a difference? I feel relaxed. Feel relaxed? I feel relaxed. So that was for me too. So, so that's an important thing uh, when we do these breath exercises. We're going to kind of check in with how we feel before the exercise. And then we're going to check in with how we feel after so we can observe in ourself how it actually feels in our body to do these different breath exercises. So breath work is the conscious use of the breath to uh, change your awareness and your uh, and use for healing and for personal awakening and transformation in the spirit, the mind and the body. And, you know, before we get too far into talking about breathwork or, or experiencing more of it, um, there are a couple safety disclaimers to, to give. Um, the most important thing in breathwork or any type of energetic or body work is to honor your own body, to honor your own system. And, you know, what that might look like is if we're doing a breathwork exercise and you start feeling lightheaded and you don't like how you're feeling, it's lightheaded in a bad way, then honor your body and back off the breath a little bit. You know, don't breathe quite as heavy or quite as fast or quite as deep. And in breath work, it's a really empowering thing because we have the gas pedal. We have control of the experience, you know, with how fast and hard we breathe. Um, so that's a really important part. And if you do have any type of existing, you know, uh, respiratory or heart issues or conditions, you can still do breath work. It's just really important to gently and gracefully move into it. Don't jump in and breathe as hard as you can for, you know, half an hour. That wouldn't, I wouldn't advise that. So there are, for all breath work exercises, there are three basic skills or elements that are involved. And the first one is awareness, and this is the, the consciousness factor. Um, and in our everyday life, when our awareness is scattered, our healing power and our creativity dissipates. We don't have the power to regulate and maintain some of our, our best natural functions in our body like the rest and digest and the different functions that the heal and repair the body automatically when we do our part to take care of ourselves. So when we focus our awareness on the breath and do conscious breathing in, in breath work, it really fuels the uh, inner healer. And the inner healer wants to help move us to homeostasis, to a point of balance. And that's just, there's all these systems in the body that naturally want to move us back to that place all the time. What stops them is us being stressed or our ego telling us that we know what we should be doing instead of some self-care time, things like that. So focusing that awareness is an important piece. The second one is relaxation. And this is the release factor. When we breathe consciously, and we're aware of the breath, and then we relax, the relaxation is what helps us let go. So in sung breathing, when we make it our intention to let go, we can actually relax into that, and the body does that for us. The body can let go of these little tensions. And um, if we do it, we hold our intention or our awareness around an area of the body that might be feeling a little stuck or a little sore, and you breathe, relax, and just keep your awareness there, you'll notice often that that 
will disappear. So it's just, that's a natural thing the body can do when we let it do it. And the third skill or element of all breathwork exercises is the breathing. And I am just in love with this metaphor of bellows fueling a fire. And if you imagine uh, in yoga or qigong or anything that uses the breath or breathwork to as an active participant in the exercise, if you imagine these bellows on the inhale, you're charging up the bellow, you know, you're, that's all the potential. And on the exhale, you're fueling the fire, you're, you're shooting that air in. That is what it's like in our body, that the, the breath work fuels that awareness, it fuels the relaxation and helps the process happen, basically. So the magic and the power of breath work comes from the combination of those three things. And there's two basic aspects of breath work. So the first is breath awareness. And that's like mindfulness meditation, where you just watch the breath. You observe it, you don't do it. You just see this natural thing happening. You don't judge it, you let it happen as is. And if you do it long enough, you'll probably slide into a nice deep meditation. You might have some juicy new insights on your life or, you know, so just that alone is powerful. Another really important, um, another really important breath awareness, we'll call it an exercise, is yawning. And so this is my PSA where I'm going to get up on my soapbox about yawning and Trisha knows from Qigong class. Um, yawning is our way of surrendering to these natural flows of energy that come along and tell you, hey, it's time to yawn. And we've kind of been conditioned from when we were kids in school and yawning that if you go, oh, that everybody's going to look at you like that was pretty rude of you. Or the pe person speaking might think, am I boring you right now? So we kind of do like one of these and we kind of yawn to ourselves, and we do everything we can. At least I do. And this is, I see other people do this. So the function of yawning is actually to help clear out the subtle energy bodies, clear out stagnant energy in those subtle bodies. And when we get more clear in those subtle areas, energetically in our body, it helps us to be more present and to really be able to sit with somebody and hear them and feel them. And, and, you know, an interesting thing is people with more empathy uh, are more likely to catch a yawn in a group of people. And on the flip side, people who are sociopaths can never catch a yawn. So not telling you to judge people when they don't catch a yawn, but you know, you could. So, Please, if you have to yawn here, let it, let it go. Let it rip the best you can. I encourage it. Okay, enough with the yawning. Um, so the other side, so there's aware, that's breath awareness, um, where we just watch it, we don't do it. The other side is conscious breathing, where we are doing the breathing. We have an intention on how we want to breathe. We give the air a certain type of quality. Maybe we're breathing hard and fast through the mouth. Maybe we're breathing slow. Maybe we're giving it a sound. We're working with the breath to do something and uh, our awareness is around that. And we're using the breath to fuel an experience for us. All right, so now the, the physiology part of this. Um, you know, the way that we know that breath work works and other than just feeling better, which we do when we, when we typically we feel better when we do breath work is there's been a lot of research that has gone into our autonomic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is made up of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And to make it, you know, easy, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, can be looked at as the physiological gas pedal. It is what 
when we deem there is some kind of danger, we hit the gas and we, everything in our body, in all of its wisdom and in the way it was created, says, okay, we need to either escape or fight, or we can't do anything, we freeze. And all the way from our cognitive abilities, everything goes into the limbic part of our brain, which is the fear circuitry. Meaning, if we are stressed out and we're in a group of people, we can't, I can't hear what you're saying on a deeper level. I can't use my higher cognitive functioning. All I can understand is aggression, avoidance, running, things that will help me survive in, in that type of a survival situation. And consciously, we're not afraid that we're about to die in those situations. But physiologically, our body is getting us ready to make a move. Um, so before I go off too far on a tangent, um, so the sympathetic nervous system, what happens is it, is it speeds up our heart and respiration. Um, it puts a hold on all non-essential functions in the body. And, and that's a big one. So things like digestion, you know, because the system wasn't designed to be run for days. It was designed to be run until the threat was neutralized. So things like digestion can't function at its full potential when we're in the SNS side of things. Um, many people often spend too much time in the SNS part of things, the sympathetic nervous system. And that's when you see people or you might ex yourself experience overreacting to things and not understanding why, like you might look back and think, why did I react that way? Well, it was, prob it was probably because you were, maybe had spent too much time because of stress or something happened that kept you into that SNS side of your autonomic nervous system. Um, you know, another thing that is kind of scary to think about is that if you spend too much time in that system, people who are stressed out chronically and stay in that side of things often feel unsafe just as a baseline, you know, and it's because they may not even be sure why, but it's because their body is telling them that we need to do something. I can't settle down right now because we either need to run or fight or do something. And that energy has to go somewhere and it kind of goes to a place of fear. So on the flip side, on the happy side of this, is the parasympathetic nervous system. And this can be looked at as the brake pedal, the slow down, slows down the heart rate, slows down the respiration. It triggers functions in the body like the rest and digest and the restore and repair functions. And, you know, recently in, in the past uh, 20 years, so relatively recently, they have come up with kind of a third part, the polyvagal theory. And that is based on, there's the SNS, which is the sympathetic nervous system, the PNS, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, and the vagus system. And those systems help us deal with life. So the pathways of the PNS travel through two large nerves in the body, and those are the vagus nerves. And they run down the stem of the brain through the body to all the internal organs. And they send messages back and forth through those organs. And by just choosing to slow down our respiration through deep intentional breathing, we can trigger our relaxation response. So meaning we just learn what happens when you're in the sympathetic nervous system. You don't have access to these higher level cognitive abilities. If you can realize that you're stressed out, then know that you're in the sympathetic nervous system. So if you're having a heavy discussion with a family member, somebody who you would want to be able to express and feel empathy for, who you would want to feel a connection to and communicate to the best of your ability, whether it's that conversation or what happened before that conversation, you could still be in the sympathetic nervous system. And by just choosing to, okay, give me a second here. Right. 
you know, and do a couple of them and it's tapping into the parasympathetic side where you now have higher level functioning. And, you know, it reminds just that thing alone is to me such a valuable piece to take into our everyday lives without any breath exercises, just the understanding that we can control that by choosing to slow down the breath, try to trigger that relaxation response. Um, and, you know, it really helps us to connect with people on a deeper level. So once that response is initiated and the PNS is dominant, our brain ceases to be governed by the limbic system that we talked about earlier, the fear circuitry in the body that limits our capacity capacity to effectively think, plan, reason, and respond to others. So that means that we no longer are subject to the narrow range of defensive and escape behaviors. Because when we're in the SNS side of things, where we automatically respond in a system of ways, uh, all we can do is think about escaping or defense, fight or flight. So getting out of that system and into the one that lets us connect is probably where we all would rather be. So just breathing deeply and slowly can be enough to trigger that. Um, how long would you say, Erica, can you, by breathing, how long would you say that, does that vary or? How long does it? For, for it to switch from the. Um, within, a, within a minute. Does it happen? Yeah, I mean, it can even happen quicker than that. It really depends on your pra practice. So practicing some of these exercises that we'll go into, you'll be able to, you know, for me, I refer to it as taking a hit of breath medicine because two breaths, three breaths, you know, after you practice it for a while, if, you're, if your intention is on those bellows, so you're stoking, you're fueling everything up, and then when you exhale, a long, slow exhale, and just visualize everything's swirling and it just, it, it can be a really uh, powerful thing. Yeah, so it's a, it's a practice thing. But even starting out, just breathing deep, you know, a minute and you can switch that over. And immediately it will start to transition, you know, cause it's not a black or white thing. There are some shades of gray in there. So you can come from SNS all the way up here and bring it down right away, you know, which, which is good. Good question. And yeah, anybody please ask any questions you have throughout. So the first exercise that we're going to do is a second exercise. We did sun breathing. So the first, the second one is called a heart coherence practice. And this is something to do three times a day for about five minutes. You can set your alarm on your phone. Um, it is to, to say, hey, it's time to do this, and then you can use your timer for five minutes. Um, this is something that I really am recommending to everybody as do this one, if nothing else, because you can do it while you're doing other things. So if you're really busy, like sometimes I have a hard time chiseling out time for self-care, this can be one that you can do on your way somewhere. You can do it while you're walking. You can do it anytime. And it really is as simple as taking five second inhales and five second exhales. And there's more science to it than that that we'll get into, but the practice is that simple. And we'll jump into the science, a little background on it, and then we'll do it for, for ourselves. So heart coherence is a specific state of increased heart rate variability induced by conscious breathing when a person is in a more coherent state there's a shift in the relative autonomic balance toward increased parasympathetic activity. Increased heart-brain syn synchronization and entrainment between diverse physiological systems. In that mode, the body's systems function with a high degree of efficiency and harmony. So boiling that down, that last sentence was the really the takeaway. Your body is functioning really, really efficiently. And heart rate vari variability, I have the definition here, and then I'm gonna give you my very simple explanation of it. Um, it's the heart's ability to accelerate and decelerate in relation to changes in your internal and external environments. 
and the range of the variability reflects your capacity to deal and cope with change in your life. So we would want the variability to be as much as we can. And to increase that number, we have to spend our time in the parasympathetic side of things. So this exercise helps us get there and helps us stay there more often. And the, dip, the, the way to understand heart rate variability is I saw a great graph that unfortunately I wasn't able to put on this outline, but I will use my hands to demonstrate it anyway. So when you're in the sympathetic side of the nervous system, you know, and if you were hooked up to heart, a uh, heart monitor, your graph would look like this, something like it would be jaggy, it would go up, it would go up and down, it would go like this. The heart rate variability part is the distance between this, the top of this spine and the bottom of this one. So each one, not, you know, it might go from all the way down here, all the way up here, but it's measuring this. So when you're in the parasympathetic, parasympathetic side of the nervous system, your heart rate would look like this. Each one would go tall down to low. Each one would be a bigger distance by a lot than the sympathetic nervous system. And this exercise triggers heart coherence. So it puts us into this place. So some of the things that happen uh, when we do that are just doing this three times a day uh, for five minutes each. And it might even sound like a lot, but when you get in the habit of it, you can multitask with this one. You know, you can be, as long as it's not too, you know, too intense what you're doing. Um, you can lower your blood pressure, heart rate, and cortisol levels by up to 20%. So that's pretty huge in and of itself. Uh, you can, there's a reduction in the cortisol levels, an increase in oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin levels, and an increase in brain alpha levels when we do this. And five minutes of doing this exercise has the effects last for five hours into the rest of your day. So you can see how doing this three times a day, you know, and by the end of that five hours, the effects are a lot less than right away. But the fact that even a lingering effect can be there from something so simple, it's powerful stuff. The, the input that you have to do is very low and what you get out of it, you know, I recently taught my dad how to do this. And I said, at the very least, you're going to feel great. Like when you're done doing it, if all the other stuff is, you know, BS, then at least you feel good, you know, right when you do it. So to me, that's worth doing it alone. So we are going to try this and one thing that we can add power to this. So anytime when we're doing breath work and we're getting into working consciously with the breath, which is a system that works automatically on an unconscious level. And we also uh, can work with consciously. And it's the only system in the body where we have the opportunity to do that work with the system consciously and unconsciously. We can't consciously beat our heart, but we can consciously, most people can't, I'll say. Uh, but we can consciously breathe in a way that affects our body. Um, so to make this more powerful, when you do this exercise, you can set an intention for that specific five minutes of breathing. And to take that up a notch again, during the practice, then you can set, uh, create an affirmation. So if my, and that for anybody who hasn't created their own affirmations, it is creating an I am statement. So if my intention is to relax, my affirmation should affirm to me that I'm already that. So it would be, I am relaxed. I am relaxed. And I would say that to myself as I breathe. Now to make this one easy, I'm going to keep pace so you don't have to count. Uh, we're going to use the singing bowl and I'll keep pace for you. So what I would say is, Let's spend the next minute thinking of what you want your intention to be and creating your affirmation. Yes. Can you do this breathing laying down? Yeah, absolutely. If you'd like to lay down right now. I have to do it. I have a back spasm. 
and you can lay down the whole time. I I appreciate that. Yeah. Ed's Ed's comfortable behind you too, so everybody do whatever feels right and comfortable for you. Yes. Okay, thanks. Can you, when we start this, can you just give me a uh, five minute? Yeah. Let me know in five minutes. I'll keep pace. Yeah. Does everybody have an affirmation ready? Or does anybody need help creating an affirmation? The statement part? Everybody's good. So what I'm going to be doing with the ball is every five seconds I'm going to tap. So if you're you're going to inhale, five seconds is going to go by. You're going to exhale. So it's going to be you're switching on that. And I'm going to count to myself and hopefully keep a really nice pace for you. All right, so everybody has their affirmation. So start out with a few just nice deep breaths and I'll count down into the start so that we're all on a good pace. Yeah, down into the belly. Yep, yep, that's okay. All right, so we're going to take the first inhale in three, two, one.
slowly open your eyes when you're ready. Taking your time. And anytime after doing that, it's good to kind of just start by wiggling your fingers and your toes and really feeling yourself and your body again. It's easy you know, when you're in a rhythmic state like that to sometimes kind of become a little ungrounded. So take a minute to feel yourself in your body. So because this exercise helps us get into a place of heart coherence and it helps get our body into a state of coherence where all the systems in the body are working more efficiently, if you want to really express love for someone or be present with someone or empathy or any kind of higher level cognitive or energetic ability. Taking a, a few minutes, doesn't have to be five, a few minutes to just breathe in this way. All you have to do is count to yourself. One, two, three, four, five, and then switch. It can really help put you into a place where you have, you can reach these higher level or, or higher depths of empathy. Uh, because everything else is, everything's functioning at a high level in the body when we're in this state. So, how did that feel? What were the, were there any challenges to breathing in that way? And how does it feel now afterward? It was really challenging at first, and then I'm not really sure how long into it, um, but it, it became so rhythmic and mm. easy, but in the beginning, yeah. It was a little difficult, but it, at some point it just became really natural. Cool. Yeah, thank you. That's great. I think a lot of, like, I've, when I first started doing the practice and I thought, you know, I was a deep breather and, you know, from doing Qigong a lot and it, staying with it in that rhythm at first was a little, a little tricky. And then, like you said, it kind of slipped into it being really natural. So we're going to do one more exercise before we move on into talking about the workshop. So this is another one where you will be laying down when we do it, but to get into a little of the background first, um, this is one of Wim Hof's uh, techniques that he uses. Does anybody know who Wim Hof is besides Ed and Lori? I know they've trained with him. Do you know Wim Hof? So Wim Hof climbed Mount Everest in board shorts and sandals. He has been submerged in ice, right, Laurie? You guys have seen him personally submerged in ice. Uh, Up to yeah, for how long? <laughs> well, I think at 20 minutes, the doctor that was measuring all his vitals said he would have been, anybody else would have been dead. Right. Under normal circumstances. And he was able to actually raise his body temperature one degree, right? the ice would just melt on the skin. Right. Even though he's packed in it. So using breath work. And I'm not going to be teaching you that method, or maybe I am, but you know, I don't know if it's, you're going to, I wouldn't jump in any ice or climb Everest after this, but this is a good one to start, to start working with. And this is a nice uh, daily practice. You can do it once, twice, three times a day. Uh, for me, once a day feels right. But it's something you can play with, and, and all of these are, are things you can play with. But, you know, the benefits of this one are it's an increased energy. 
Um, it increases immune functioning in your body. It improves your concentration, blood circulation, mood and performance. So it's a great one for athletes, um, but really all of us can use those things. Uh, so it's good for humans. Um, and the way you do it is pretty simple. We'll go through the technique and then I'll kind of guide you through it again. But for this one, we take a few like deep breaths to, to get ourselves ready. And this is a laying down one. And then you basically breathe for, for we're going to do three minutes just to get a, a kind of taste of it. But you breathe in a connected fashion, deep breaths, where you're really taking a nice big inhale and then you're just letting go of the exhale. So it can be, and you can breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth or in through the mouth and out through the mouth. But the mouth is an area that when we leave the mouth open, we can let go of more emotional things if there are any. So it's good to, with this type of a breathing practice, get into the habit of exhaling through the mouth. Um, in a perfect world, you inhale through the nose. Um, but if that's uncomfortable to switch back and forth, try doing through the mouth. And if that's uncomfortable, do whatever's comfortable. You know, that's the default. That's the most important part. So the way we're going to do it is it's going to be three minutes of this deep breathing that looks like letting go of the breath and really getting a nice big inhale. After three minutes, I'm going to prompt you, okay, this is the last inhale and everybody's going to be at a different spot. So everybody take one more big inhale and then you exhale all the way out and you hold the breath with the breath out and you hold it until it feels like you need to take another breath. And if you don't think you need another breath before your diaphragm starts to quiver, when it starts to quiver, that means it's time to take another breath. Um, and, and that can happen, you know, doing this exercise because what you're doing is you're really oxygenating your body and you're able to, if you really relax into that place, you're able to really hold the breath for longer than you could think. I would imagine for me, for me, that was the case. And for other people I've watched, that was the case. Um, now when you do this on your own, you can do three rounds of it in a row and you'll find that by the time you get to the third round, your hold times build on each other. So the first, you, maybe you can only hold for 30 seconds on the first one or, or less. Um, the next one might be 45 seconds or a minute. And then the last one could be a minute and a half. Um, and there's people who doing this kind of method can hold their breath over three minutes, easy. So I can't, but there are people who can. Any questions on that? Any part of that? So, yes, we're, doing three rounds, so. we're going to do one round today. Oh, one round. Yeah, just to get a, get a taste, but when, yes. And laying down is what you're Yes, doing. yep. Um, laying down with this type of breathing really helps to keep you from feeling as lightheaded. And if you do feel lightheaded, just back off the breath. You know, you have, that's the gas pedal here. Now, after you do exhale, and you'll exhale whenever it's right for you, after you do exhale, Take a nice big in, or after you inhale, yes, after you held the exhale out at the very end and it's time to inhale, take an inhale and hold it for 10 seconds and then that's it. Then you go to relaxed breathing. So everybody's going to be at a different pace when we do this. So we're going to just give it a few minutes. So take a few minutes after this and just close your eyes and relax and breathe. Yes. Mm. So it might not be the best for them. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And again, I'll let you know when three minutes is, is coming up and I'll, I'll say this is the last breath. So just take one more full inhale at that point and then you're going to exhale that all the way out and hold it until it, it's time to breathe in. So take a few relaxing breaths here first. Hands can either be on the abdomen or laying on the ground facing up. 
whichever is more comfortable. And remember, once we start breathing, try to eliminate the pause between the inhale and the exhale. Breathing in a connected way. All right, so when you're ready, let's begin. Nice, deep inhales, letting go of the exhale. No pause in between. Remembering the breath is the fuel for the experience. All right, so let's take our last big inhale before we exhale all the air out and hold with all the air out. Then we're gonna relax. We just got lots of oxygen in the body. Let every part of the body relax. Whenever it's time to inhale, you can inhale and hold that inhale for 10 seconds before returning back to relax belly breathing.
And as we breathe here, nice and relaxed, you want to feel yourself supported by Mother Earth from below. Always there, supporting us in the right and perfect way for us. Totally safe and supported. bringing your awareness fully into your body, wiggling your toes and your fingers. Feeling the weight of your body on the floor. Taking your time and at your own pace, coming back to seated if that's comfortable or laying is fine as well. So how did that one feel compared to the others from your before and after? I found that it felt very good doing that and I was keenly aware of my heart beating. Mm. I could feel it. Yeah. Not really in touch with my heart. Nice. Yeah, that's a beautiful uh, effect of that type of breathing. That's nice. Thank you for sharing that. Did anybody find it challenging breathing in that way? Yeah, just the the pacing of or uh, which part? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Did you slow down a little bit when it, when you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had to just kind of like take it back a step. Mhm. Mm cool. Well, good. That's that's the idea of honoring what's right for your body too. And, you know, doing these types of practices, uh, <clears throat> like we were talking earlier, it's kind of a, it's a muscle that we're learning to flex and we're seeing where's the boundary and we touch the boundary and we, okay, I'll stay back a little bit and we keep touching and seeing where that boundary is. Um, another exercise like that is the nine breath method <clears throat> in Qigong, where there's, there's a boundary there, you know, and we don't really know where it is until we start to touch it, you know? And then the more familiar we are with that, one, it keeps moving this way. Um, but, but two, um, it kind of teaches us how to work with our body and work within our own system, which is a good, good thing to do. So there is one more um, breath exercise 
and we're not going to do it today, but it's on your outline here and it's conscious detox practice. And it is using Kapalabhati, Kapalabhati uh, Pranayama, which is sharp inhales and exhales and are sharp uh, inhales and exhales with an emphasis on the exhale and paradoxical breathing. So where you inhale and the, and the belly and the diaphragm are actually moving in and up. And as you exhale, it continues to move in and up. And you're basically squeegeeing with your visualization and your energy, the whole body, and you're letting it all flow out the mouth to detox. Uh, it is a really fun one to do because it's different than we ever do. Um, but it's another one where if you overdo it in the first part, the sharp breaths, you can feel lightheaded. So it's another one where go into it gently, see where that boundary is, back off the boundary and kind of learn your way through that gently without going too fast. Are you familiar with that, Laurie, this type? Yeah. 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 The other one. I... Not the paradoxical, no. but I figured your yoga background, you would know that one. Um, so we're going to go and we're going to talk about the breath illumination workshop. So this is a workshop that I created that works with around breath journey. And there's, uh, there's a few different types of breath work that do these breath journeys, but this one in particular is a four hour workshop that is around a 90 minute breath journey. And basically what that is, is you breathers or participants in the workshop breathe in a rhythmic type of way using a technique that we teach that is not that unsimilar, that is similar to the one you guys just did. It's a connected breathing. And the basic instruction is that you breathe deeper and faster. And 90 minutes sounds like a really long time, but there's this little like part in the beginning where it feels unnatural and uncomfortable. And then you just go through it. And all of a sudden there's a shift from my conscious mind saying, this is weird. This is weird. What should I do to your body starts to take over and you enter this, it's called non ordinary state of consciousness. And Basically, in simple terms, that is when your ego and your mind sit right over here and, and they're still there. You still are aware of these thoughts and they pop in, they pop out, but you feel this automatic thing taking over and it's, I call it the inner healer. It's your body's innate inner wisdom and your body has, like we talked about earlier, your body has all these systems in it that are designed to put you back to homeostasis, to make you balanced, to make you centered. So when we get into this non-ordinary state, our inner healer can say, oh, okay, now we can do this quickly because I don't have to deal with the ego. I don't have to argue with him about taking care of you. So he can pick and pluck all these little things that we store in the body, different, it could be a trauma or a memory or anything that we're that our inner healer says it's now's the time to let go of this. Um, and you might be walking around thinking, I don't have any traumas, but trauma doesn't have to be a big ordeal that we're consciously aware of. It can be a little thing that happened when we were a kid that stuck a certain kind of way in our body. Um, it could be something that happened when we were a fetus in the womb. You know, it could be, and, and that one in particular, like those are those memories when we were a fetus are stored physically. So we wouldn't be able to consciously think about it and recall it and remember it. It's a physical memory stored in the body. And if it was a physical trauma stored in the body, the only way to let go of it is by working through it in some type of way like this. Um, so the way the, the way this works is, well, first, the facilitator in this, and part of the reason I really am drawn to this is because I feel that my purpose is to help connect people to their own healer, to discover that you are, we're all healers. I mean, nobody questions that your own body heals 
the cold, uh, when you catch a cold, that it heals, all these things that it constantly heals. But sometimes when you tell somebody they're a healer, they might not, they might not embrace it as much, but you really are. And connecting people to that idea is what makes me feel passionate and, and really alive. So that's why I'm doing this. Um, the facilitator in these breath journeys or facilitators, depending on how many people it is, their job isn't to heal you. It isn't to uh, do something to you. It is the same as a midwife in a birthing process. The facilitator is there to support a natural process that your body knows how to do. The midwife might tell you, hey, try this or try that. And that might help your body naturally do what it does. That's kind of the idea in, in natural birthing scenarios is support the body and, and support the, the mom to be in letting this happen. That's the same as these breath journeys. The facilitator's job is to empower the breathers with some techniques and create a safe container for this transformative work to happen in. And that's what we, we do in these workshops. So I found that midwife uh, analogy to be really good because it does illustrate the point that we're there. We help you feel safe. We help empower you with some techniques, but you're the ones doing the work, you know. Um, I almost made a really terrible metaphorical joke that I wasn't, that I'm glad I didn't make. Um, so bring myself back. All right. <laughs> All right. Got it. So uh, this style of breath work, these breath journeys, it was really developed in the late 60s, early 70s when researchers were doing a lot of research with LSD. And they were finding that when used in a therapeutic setting, in a controlled environment, that they were able to help their patients without much instruction get to a place of rapid healing. And it was through that non-ordinary state of consciousness because when people got into that place in a therapeutic setting where the intention is to heal and to work with oneself, um, they were able to let go of a lot of things really quickly. And then, as we all know, things started, it started being used in lots of different ways and, and became all kinds of different things. So there was a crackdown legally on that and researchers weren't able to work with it in the same free way they were before. So what they did was uh, they thought, okay, so these receptors are there. They're in the brain and this substance could trigger them. So what, how can we trigger them? You know, how can we consciously uh, and purposely trigger them without any substance at all? And they developed these breathwork uh, techniques. The biggest difference between the two is that on psychedelics, you don't have control of the gas pedal. You don't have control, okay, I'm ready to stop this, I want out, you're in it. Uh, in breath work, all you do is back off the breath. You back off the breath, that takes the fuel out of it, and you slowly, it just eases up. And that really is the the lever on the intensity of the experience, how hard you're able to breathe, how fast, um, and how much air you can move in and out, basically. So there's two concerns people have when thinking, okay, is a workshop like this or is a breath journeying thing right for me? So the first one is, is it gonna be too much? Am I gonna get in over my head, it's gonna be terrifying or something, you know, it's not gonna be, right for me and I'll freak out. So back to what we were saying about the inner healer moving you towards homeostasis. So your body's job when your mind and ego are out of the way is to help bring you back to center, to, to make decisions automatically that bring you back to center. So that's where your inner healer choosing what's right to come up for you comes into play. Something's not gonna come up that you're not ready to let go of, that you shouldn't have the opportunity to let go of. Um, because it's not gonna bring something up for you that is going to move you further away from homeostasis. 
And the second part is for the other fear people have is, is nothing going to happen? Am I going to spend all this time breathing in this way and then I'm just going to be annoyed because I just had to breathe hard for, you know, 90 minutes. And the, uh, the kind of the trigger for this experience and what kind of helps go into that uh, non-ordinary state is the emotions, you know. Um, and what I tell people and what I say in the workshop is if you're feeling frustrated because the person next to you smells or the music isn't the music you like or you're frustrated because nothing's happening yet, go with the frustration. Go into the frustration. Feel, embrace the frustration. Embrace the anger or the sadness or whatever that frustration feels like. And stay with that because that is what's going to take you into the experience. And it's not always uncomfortable either. Sometimes people crack up laughing the whole time because that's what their inner healer says. Okay, this is what you need to come back to center. So here's the experience you're going to have. Um, and there are four different types of experiences people have in these non-ordinary states of consciousness. The first is a sensory experience. And that basically is physical letting go. And, and that can be letting go of emotion, emotional traumas, emotional stagnant energy, or physical. But it comes out physically. And that might feel like heat, might feel like uh, cold, uh, like coldness. It could feel like tetany. You could feel your hands kind of feel like they're locking up a little bit or just physical things happening, you know, and that is kind of the body unraveling these, this stagnant energy and letting, and it's your body's way of getting rid of it. Um, the next uh, experience is a biographical experience, and that's when people have a visual experience of things from the past and sometimes they could be experiencing something that their inner healer says, okay, now you're ready to, now you're capable of processing this. When it happened, you weren't, so we blocked it. And that's how we, that's how we come to get these blocked experiences where uh, it's a trauma that maybe happened when we were a kid and we just weren't able to, for our own sake, we weren't able to handle it. We weren't able to fully process it. So our inner healer said, nope, you're going back here on this back shelf to a later date. And that could be the later date. If it's appropriate for you at that time, your inner healer could bring that up for you. And I actually heard a really, really cool example of this um, because it can, you know, depending on your beliefs, uh, it can go into past life stuff as well. And there's a story about a guy who was terribly afraid of water like never took baths, he took showers, but never bathed in water, never got in a pool, never went near the ocean. And he went through one of these breath work journeys and he experienced himself, but it didn't look like him. He was experiencing himself in a past life drowning and he went through the experience of drowning and it wasn't, he just observed it, you know, he, it was uncomfortable, but he observed it, and after it happened, he let it go the whole time, breathing still, to fuel the experience. And at the end of it, he no longer had any fear of water because he was able to process that thing that was stuck so deep that he had no clue it was even there, other than his irrational fear of water. So that's another example of how, again, depending on if you believe in past life. If you don't, it, maybe it was something else showing up for him. Um, the next one is transpersonal. And that is, you know, the breather could feel really connected to the universe. They could feel like they're a bird flying through the sky, you know, and, and this is more what we imagine when we think of non-ordinary states. Um, it can be, you know, and a lot of times those experiences bring insight. Maybe it's an animal that we should pay more attention to because maybe that is what's going to bring us some kind of, you know, messages in our everyday life or show up when there's danger or, you know, it, there can be all different types of things. Um, but that's where a lot of times insights can come to you in that transpersonal 
place. And the last one is perinatal. And that is basically everything from conception until the point when you come out through the birth canal. And like we talked about, you know, research, they have done a lot of research on, on this area and they've determined that we can't have conscious memories of like, oh, I remember, you know, I, you know, my mom did this and that. But what you can have is physical memories. And so if you had a mother who, you know, was really uh, took great care of herself and, you know, took good care of you energetically in her body, it might feel the memory that's there just might be a nice rocking, watery ocean feeling. So it's something that probably would never come up. But if it was a mother who used drugs and things like that, it might might leave that it might leave a physical trauma that the person has no idea is there. So this can be a time when those can be uh, experienced and let go. And so that is it for the different types of experiences. Um, does anybody have any questions around the breath illumination workshop? So before that, I just thought of one more thing I want to say. So I'll give you a little more info about kind of what we do around it. So leading up to it, you know, we start out with a check-in. We do a prayer to, to set the space with our intention. And then we check in. And checking in is a way that we all get present and open up to the group. And it helps form a really strong container for the whole group as well as individually for us to be vulnerable. And then we go over some of the techniques that we use in, in the breathing. Some of the things that can come up. If this happens, here's what you should do. Things like that. Then the 90 minutes. And then after that, we, we really gradually come back. And I say 90 minutes, but it could be 45 minutes for you or it could be 90. And it can be anywhere in between. Um, because there will be a point when you just feel, okay, I'm good. It's time to, it's time to go back to relaxed breathing. And, and that's totally fine. You know, there's no rule on how long you have to breathe in this connected way. And when you go back to that relaxed breathing, you know, typically for most people, it's a really blissful, just your body's feeling really great. So we just sit in that feeling for a while. And then we slowly come back and we do some journaling and artwork. And that is to kind of take the experience that happened that we're translating with our brain and to put it onto paper, to ground it, to make it to real and to kind of take it out of our brain and put it onto paper. And that can be a way we can use our creativity to kind of put that out. And then after that, we kind of do a final round where we can share the experience uh, if you want. It's an optional thing, but it for, does help further ground the experience and own the experience as yours. And then we check out and we close the container. So it's a really, uh, it's a really safe and supportive way of doing this kind of work. Okay, now, does anybody have any questions? or anything at all that we talked about? You just answered my question. What was it gonna, which one? Well, what do you do with the rest of the time? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so four hours, uh, you know, it, part of it is to have a nice amount of, we don't wanna rush in any way afterwards. You know, I wanna make sure, we do a couple of little grounding exercises. Uh, we do some, we have some snacks, you know. Do a lot of things to really integrate what can sometimes be a profound experience um, in a really gentle and safe and, and hopefully smooth way so that when you leave, you feel like, you know, I got this. You know, I'm not, I didn't just have a, a crazy experience that now I'm going to have to deal with outside of here. Uh, you should leave feeling integrated and fully yourself. So yeah, that's why it's important to have extra time to do those extra things. All right, well, if nobody has any other questions, we are done. That's it. Thank you. So thank you for coming. I appreciate everybody being here. And if you take two things, I'm gonna give you two things to take if nothing else. Um, when you're stressed, 
and you can recognize that you're stressed, recognize that you're in the sympathetic nervous system, or just recognize, hey, I'm stressed, and I only have this much functionality because I, I'm, my body wants me to either run or fight, not talk, not show empathy. So take the moment, even if you're still talking, just set, slow it down or say, hey, I need a minute. Take a few breaths, or at least try to change the, the pace of your breathing to shift into that parasympathetic. Because that alone is really, that is a lot of power in, in recognizing here's where I am, and now I know where I could be, and I have access to this higher functionality just by breathing. So I feel like that's a, like a superhuman like tr thing that we can just flip on if we know how to do it, and now you do. And the second one is yawn. Just clear your subtle energies, get yourself open to other people, and let it rip. Let the yawn happen. You know, look at a dog when a dog yawns. It, it clears itself, uh, you know, physically by doing a nice stretch when it does it. And it, there's a sound that can come out, you know. So I, I recognize you can't always let it rip to, the, you know, the full way. It opens up the solar plexus. Yeah. It's very helpful in doing that. If your solar plex gets stuck, yeah. you can't do a full breathing. Right. And the yawn opens that up. Well, that's, that's another helpful piece then. Cool. Yes. Eric, your last two comments are why you do this. Yeah. You can speak to it directly. Um, the, the words are here. I was just wondering if there was anything that you um, would want to share with us about the healing that you've gotten from doing this work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, first off, I said about the passion, I'm passionate about connecting people to their inner healer. Um, part of the reason is. And part of the way I came to that insight is through doing these breath work journeys and really diving deep into the, you know, to the inner parts of myself. And, you know, part of my own experience with it was some of these experiences that we talked about. And, you know, and, and I don't want to share my specific experience uh, here because it's kind of outside of the container of where it happened. Um, but for me, you know, I will say I experienced myself outside of a body, you know, totally outside of a body and, and I felt a, an empathy from my higher self to myself in my body that was just like, Hey, you know, you are a human and it's hard and sometimes it sucks and you're doing a good job. And even saying it now makes me want to tear up because it is hard, you know, and so to have that validation, the divine validation, you know, that I'm here and I was there and now I'm here and just that piece can be hard sometimes. So for me, it was profound and, and you know, I've done it a few more times um, and I've, I've experienced it a bunch of times and, and every time something different, you know, and like I said earlier, it's not all uncomfortable at all. Sometimes it's just really cool. And, and one I had recently, I will share. Um, I was starting to feel like, okay, is this going to happen? And unfortunately, that was also fueled by my headphones turning off and me having to come out and turn it back on. But you won't have that problem in the workshop because there will be no headphones. So. Um, but with sleeping babies upstairs, that was my experience. So, you know, I was, but I went into that frustration and I just sat there and I and compassionately embraced it. And, you know, I felt the urge, you know, I was moving my body, which is something that in the workshop, I really show you a couple ways to situate your body where it just kind of triggers physical releases. So, you know, if you're feeling called to do it, you can do it in, in these certain ways. But I was moving my body around and I felt like putting my arms up and then I put them up and they just kind of stayed up. And it reminded me of in Qigong when we say, in this position, let the chi hold your arms. I mean, I felt like I wasn't even holding them at all. And it was okay. Now it feels like 10, 20 minutes have gone by and 
my arms are still here. And then all of a sudden I felt an embrace from the other side in a mirrored way, you know, uh, holding my hands and, you know, so it was another uh, divine connection moment. And there was no uncomfortableness in that experience, but, you know, I walked away feeling like, wow, that was, that was a deep thing that I was able to experience here just by breathing, you know? So that's why I feel so passionately about it because I've had firsthand experience of the, the range of, you know, the letting go and how good that feels to let go. You know, it can feel uncomfortable when it's happening. Um, but even, you know, the more of it you do, even as soon as you start, you open up that can of crying, you know, the cathartic release starts happening, you know, it can be like, oh, thank God, here it comes, you know, and it feels good to cry when you need to cry. You know, we probably all experienced those times where we put a sad song on and it just helps us trigger that cry that needs to happen. Um, it's like that, you know, except sometimes it's ramped up a bit. <laughs> but thank you for reminding me. All right, well, nobody has any questions. Um, the first workshop is going to be on June 10th right here at Awakening Wellness uh, on a Sunday. Um, so stay tuned for those details to come out. What time? I think 11 to 3, but we haven't... 100% lock that in. So, yeah. As soon as I do, I'll make sure it gets out everywhere. So, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate letting me share this stuff with you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah.